Hi and welcome again to my physics short video lecture series. Today's video we're going to be revisiting the simple harmonic oscillator. In my previous video I talked a little bit about the basic equation of motion for a simple harmonic oscillator which I show right here. Basically your um, if a is the rate change of the rate change of x and omega is constant um, then a plus omega squared x equals zero. So if a system obeys that equation, then it is a type of simple harmonic oscillator. Now in the last video, I basically talked about two such systems, two such physical systems, the simple uh, pendulum and the ideal spring, both of which obey this equation. And I showed how they obeyed it and I you know, from that basically obtain things for you like what is this omega um, related to as far as physical properties of these two um, systems. And I define some terms like period of motion, frequency of oscillation, angular frequency, etc. Um, what I did not do was ever really solve this equation. So this is kind of an equation of motion, but it should have some solution for x. So this term right here should have some solution um, that works in this equation. And I'm not going to explicitly solve the equation for you, but I am going to give a sort of experimental explanation for it and then show you what the solution is. So I have right here something like a simple pendulum. It's basically a string and then there's some weights at the end of it. And if I displace from equilibrium, equilibrium is hanging vertically like this, if I displace it from equilibrium and release at a small angle of displacement, it swings back and forth. And you could imagine, and, and you can actually maybe do this, um, watching one frame at a time. I think on YouTube you get 24 frames per second, something like that. But if you watch one frame at a time, this thing will basically appear in a different location at each frame. And so it turns out it's moving fastest near here, it's moving slowest here, so you'll have a bunch of frames that are like this, and then maybe some frames where the motion's a little bit bigger. In any case, you can track its motion frame by frame, and you know maybe like make a plot of how far this way or this way has it moved from this equilibrium position? What's the displacement? So maybe this is positive and this is a negative displacement and you know how far um, horizontally has it moved? Okay and you can do likewise with the other system that we discussed which was of course the um, masses on the end of a spring. So if I take a spring um, with a bunch of masses attached to it and allow you to um, plot the same, like maybe here's the equilibrium position where it's at rest. I pull down and release. And you can again track this frame by frame and measure where is this relative to that equilibrium position. So here would be like y equals zero or x equals zero and then down here would be positive and up here would be negative or vice versa. Okay, and so you could track that and then plot what does the displacement look like as a function of time. If you do that, you would get something that looks like this. Okay, so this is the simple harmonic um, displacement from equilibrium as a function of time. Sorry for the typo up here. Um, Basically, what you would get is a function that looks like this back and forth um, wiggle. Now, you should be looking at this function and noting, of course, that I have labeled um, displacement zero at right here. And so this right here is sort of the actual location of your time or x-axis, if you will. Um, so looking at that and now looking at functions that do this back and forth across that axis, you should be trying to figure out what kind of function does this look like. 
you might pause before I give you the answer and, and try to come up with it. Um, but if you want the answer, I'll just give it to you here. Um, this looks like either a cosine or a sine function. Now I claim that it could be either one. Um, if you're just thinking that this looks like um, let's say delta x is displacement, or excuse me, x is displacement, then this looks like x equals cosine of something times time. And looking at here, we're going from 1 to minus 1, so you know there's maybe an amplitude of 1. And then in here, I should maybe have something to describe this. That's fine. This is a valid solution. You could also say that this is the same as 1 times the sine of that same omega times t, but with an additional um, factor. And what that additional factor is, is that we are adding a pi over 2 to this sine. Okay, and if you do that, then you will also get this term. Okay. Now, um, what I want to do is I have a, basically the code that I use to write this. It's not a very long code by any stretch of the imagination. And this, this, and this are basically my kind of parameters that I can control in the code without having to go in and mess with anything. A, T, and phi zero. Okay. And if you look at how the code is written, this right here is what I'm actually plotting. You can ignore the next two lines um, because here's the plot line. And then this is just telling it to put labels on the axis. So this right here is the line I'm plotting. And you can see it's A times cosine of omega, where omega is defined in terms of t. So A times cosine omega times little t, which is time plus phi zero. So let's see what happens if we change each of those parameters just to make sure um, that we know what they do. So I'm going to double A. I'm going to make it two instead of one. Um, right now, this right here is the plot. So now I'm going to go ahead and run it again. And it will have plotted it. And it looks pretty much the same except for that if you look closely I fix the typo and also this is now running from 2 to minus 2 rather than from 1 to minus 1. The rest of the details are the same and I can even move this out of the way and sort of put this here um, over the old plot and so you can see you know the time axes have all the same values. These peaks are occurring and troughs are occurring in all the same places as before. Um, but the, the difference is that this is 2 and minus 2. This was 1 and minus 1. So A determines how tall these are. A, uh, the reason why it's labeled as A is because that's the amplitude. All right, so our solution If I write out an equation form, a cosine, this is omega, t plus, and then phi zero would look like this. Okay, so we've just discovered that this right here, this is amplitude, and this basically is maximum and minimum for that matter. value of x. Okay. Um, what else? So we can also change the omega. And as you know from before, um, we have that omega. Hello. We have that omega is 2 pi divided by t, and that matches with what's written in the code uh, right here. Omega is 2 times something that's approximately pi divided by t. 
okay? So if I change T, that changes omega. Um, T is period of oscillation. Now, what do you think that that period of oscillation is going to um, affect? So this is period of oscillation. And so I have this right now. And I'm going to change my amplitude back to 1, as it was before. I'm going to change my period from 2 to 4, let's say. Okay, so this is it with a period of 2. Here's what it looks like changing the period to 4. Uh, it's going to show it on here. All right, so what's different? Again, my max and min are the same as they were originally, but now my peaks are farther apart than they were before. You can see that there's a whole lot of peaks here and there's not as many here. In fact, originally it was two, and this right here, this point right up here, actually is at two. Here's four, six, eight, ten. And now I've changed it to four. My first peak is at four, my second peak is at 8. Okay, so that means that the period is telling us how far between peaks, how much time, t equals how much time between peaks. Similarly, it's how much time is between troughs. Like here's a trough at 1 second, here's one at 3, here's one at 5, and if I go to the new one, trough at 2, trough at 6, trough at 10. Those are four apart. These were two apart. Okay. So that's that's what omega is doing for us. What about this term right here, phi naught? So this is called phase angle or phase offset. And here I have it set originally as zero, but what happens if we change it? So um, I'm going to change it from 0 to, let's say, 1. And I'm going to give a, a replot here. Okay, so here's the new graph with this thing changed to 1. Here's the old graph. Here's the new graph. What do you see that's different about these? Oh, I'm sorry, I forgot to change the period back to 2. So let's replot it again. So with period of 2, so these two have the same period, but I have plus 1 here. What, what do you see having happened? Well, basically, stuff has now shifted over. If you look closely, this right here is closer to the 0 than this one was. This right here, you'd have to continue back here somewhere to find this peak. Okay, So everything has basically shifted. Uh, shifted to the left by a phase angle of 1. 1 what? Well, let's uh, change it from 1 to, let's say, pi over 2. Okay, so 3.1415, 296 divided by 2. And let's do it again and see what happens. Aha! So if you look at this, you can see that we've now shifted so that this point right here, where it crosses zero, has moved to basically the origin, and everything has shifted over accordingly. Okay. So now we think about what we've done. We've basically made a phase shift pi over 2 radians, or 90 degrees, but that's the same amount that you should shift to get from cosine to sine. And in fact, we made it positive. If I make it negative, that really does go from cosine to sine as opposed to cosine to negative sine. So if I turn this into a negative pi over 2, this right here now looks exactly like a sine wave. Okay? So this phase angle is basically says shift pattern left or right and left is if you add it right is if you subtract it 
um, angle is in radians. And in fact, the entire argument of this should be in radians because omega is 2 pi, which sounds like a radians thing, 2 pi over t. Okay, well, this has given us our sort of x as a function of time. Okay, sometimes this is written, by the way, in terms of y's for vertical motion, and sometimes instead of an a for amplitude, we write a y max. But either way, you end up with some function like this. And if you want x, you could say x max cosine omega t plus phi naught. Now that solves for the position as a function of time. What if we wanted to um, solve for things like velocity or acceleration? Okay. Well, for the velocity, you basically would want to maybe take instantaneous slopes of things. So like at these locations, the slope is zero. And so I'd expect the velocity to be zero. Okay, so these ones right here have v equals zero, v equals zero. Right here, these points where we cross the origin, these are points at which I have a maximum value for velocity. So v is, uh, let's say, plus or minus, plus or minus v max. And specifically, this point is minus, plus, minus, plus, minus, plus, minus, plus, minus, plus. And we know that because it's going upwards at this point, it's going downwards at this point. So how could we get it? Well, we could basically try to find slopes. We could do a sort of matching thing. Um, this sounds suspiciously like we need to shift everything by pi over 2. And specifically, we need to shift it all more or less um, um, to the left or to the right. Excuse me. And so in order to make that happen, you know, shift each of these, shift this peak so that it occurs here, shift this point so that it occurs here where you have a zero, etc. This right here is what we expect our function to be. So remember that that was a phase shift that came with plus pi over 2 um, in the cosine. So we expect v is you know, something, let's say maximum v, times cosine omega t plus phi naught plus pi over 2. But remember that that is the same thing as v max uh, times the negative sine of omega t plus phi naught. So we expect this right here. Now can we obtain that in a less hand wavy manner? The answer is yes, um, because you have conservation of energy. Let's consider a spring. Okay, so spring with mass on end. The energy for this system is given by u equals one half kx squared and by kinetic energy capital K one half mv squared. And if energy is conserved, this basically means 1 half kx squared plus 1 half mv squared must be constant. Now, x, we already know, looks like a times cosine omega t plus phi naught. Okay, so this first term, 1 half lowercase k, you now would need an a squared cosine squared omega t plus phi naught. Okay, that plus one half mv squared has to be constant. Okay, 
but that means that v squared v squared must look like something that you can add to a cosine squared term and by the way we can divide everything by this half mv so um, remember that the mass is constant and the, the halves are constant so this is like saying k times a squared cosine squared omega t plus phi naught plus v squared is constant it's just a different constant than what we had up here because we divided by half m. Okay, but that means that v squared must look like k times a squared times the function that you can add to cosine squared to get a constant, specifically sine squared because we know that sine squared of anything at all, let's say theta, plus cosine of the same thing must add to 1. That's a constant. Okay, And so by extension this means that v is actually equal to square root of k um, sorry I left off an m here v must be square root of k over m or over square root of m times a times sine omega t plus phi naught could be plus or minus by the way either one works because if I square minus sine I still get sine squared so which one is it, plus or minus? Well, from our previous discussion with the two graphs, this graph versus this graph, we should expect the answer to actually be minus. Okay, so what this means is that v is equal to minus square root k over m a sine omega t plus phi naught. Now we may say, okay, um, what does this right here have to do with for a spring? Well, remember that for a spring, omega was equal to square root k over m. So conclusion, v is equal to negative omega a sine omega t plus phi naught. Okay? Now we can do the same trick again. Um, I've run out of slides on my court kind of template, so I need to add one more slide. We can do the same trick again to figure out the values for A. So energy conservation worked for figuring out um, uh, the speed as a function of time. Energy conservation did that forces say that F equals MA and F equals KX or negative KX or put differently A plus omega squared X equals zero. That was the condition that we started this whole simple harmonic oscillator with. Okay, well this right here means that A must look like negative omega squared X. But we already know that X is some maximum value of X times the cosine of omega T plus phi naught. So now we have a solution for A. So therefore motion equations for a simple harmonic oscillator look like this. X is equal to some amplitude times the cosine of omega t plus phi naught. V is equal to negative omega times a times the sine of omega t plus phi naught. 
and acceleration a is a negative omega squared a cosine omega t plus phi naught. Final note here, the maximum value that v can have for this entire equation, if sine is equal to plus 1 or minus 1, that's the, those are the max and min possible values for sine, and multiplied by minus 1 basically means that the maximum value for the speed is omega times a. This one right here, you could say that the maximum value for the position or for the displacement from equilibrium is just a. And for this one, the maximum acceleration is omega squared a. All right. Now this video has ended up being slightly longer than what I had originally wanted, but to sort of conclude, I wanted to give you what the plots looked like. All right, so I've plotted all three now. The position, so, or displacement if you prefer, so this is x is equal to a cosine omega t, and I've chosen phi naught to be zero in each case. Um, so phi naught equals zero. I have my velocity, v is negative omega a sine omega t, and I have my acceleration, a is equal to negative omega squared big A cosine omega t. All right. So that's all that I wanted to do in today's video. Um, you could go through, if you'd like, and compare. You know, you might pause it here, but you can compare some of these things, like, is omega really the same for each of these? You'll find that, yes, it is. Um, is v max really equal to omega times the max here? So 1 times 2 pi over two, remember that the period was two. So um, for all of these things we have phi naught is zero and we have t is two uh, seconds so omega should look like uh, pi and that's in um, inverse seconds. So you can see that this one right here has an amplitude of about 3.14 this one has an amplitude of just barely, not really noticeably, but just barely less than 10. And if you look really closely here, you can see this one kind of prods above this line, and this one just kind of touches it. So it's just shy of 10. And as it turns out, pi squared is just shy of 10. Okay, so that's it for today's video. Um, I know it's a little longer than what I usually shoot for, but there was quite a lot to cover um, to get all this across. Uh, hopefully you found the extra time worthwhile and you've learned something from it. So thanks for watching.